over the last year and a half, my faith has been rocked in a more real way than I would have ever expected. I never thought this would happen to me. I really never did. I heard other people talking about, man, my faith has been so hard, or I've had so many doubts, or I've da-da-da-da-da, and I just felt like, that's not me. You know, throughout my life, and especially my teen years, I wouldn't talk about, I have these doubts, I have these questions, and especially creating content, I wanted to be like, hey, no, you know, ask God those questions, or it's okay to have doubts, and da-da-da-da-da, and like be affirming to those folks that were feeling those things. But for me, I just didn't experience that. Sure, I had my anxieties about whether God was going to provide in one area or another, but in terms of the overall scope of God's story, I knew that was true. I knew that, you know, Jesus really did come and really did die on the cross and really did die for my sins. And I I knew that God created us and all those things just seemed really just to make sense to me. Well, other people had more struggles and questions, da, 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 da. I just felt like, make sense. Until about over the last year and a half, I want to tell you why and where I am now. Okay, so I, I, I don't want you to be concerned, but I want you to listen. And hopefully this will help you engage with your faith in a more authentic way. Okay, over the last year, um, we have found out that my mom was um, diagnosed with cancer again. For some of you that have been following the channel a while or know you know more about my life personally, um, my mom had cancer about five years ago and it was stage four. It was very serious and God healed her from that. Um, but it is either returned or come back in some different fashion and, and it's even more serious this time. And so, well, she, you know, people have been asking if updates cause it's the, this isn't the first time that I've spoken of this. Um, she's doing well. Um, she's, she's getting treatments necessary and, um, you know, she personally and uh, spiritually and emotionally is doing, is doing really, really well. So thank you for all your prayers for her and continue to pray for her healing in that area as she undergoes treatments and all sorts of things like that. But that has been really, really challenging among a number of other things that have shaken me that have shaken me emotionally, personally, relationally, um, have hit me in in my core, really, okay? And I, I'm just going to be vague about that because they are personal, right? But I, I want you to know that that they were extremely real, okay? And, and, um, and they caused me to, you know, need to go to therapy, honestly. Like, that was, that's the truth of it. And I don't think you should just go to therapy when you're really in the pit, but uh, I do think if you're not already going to therapy and you're in the pit, then, you know, you should start going. And so that's where I was. I was getting angry at God. I, I told my wife this, that I was angry at God. And I, I'm sure that was, it was scary for her. But for me, I just had to be honest and say, you know what? I, I think I need to deal with some things because <sighs> I had some expectations of what I thought God was going to deliver me and was... Um, what I was entitled to, and I haven't been given those things. And in fact, God has shortchanged me in some ways. That's how I felt. And so then I looked at God and I just said, God, like, are you there? And if you are, how can you be good? And how can you be loving? And how can you really be a good father? I don't feel your love. I don't feel your presence. I feel like I'm at the end of my rope, actually, for real, for real. And I would call this next this next season of life, exploring doubt, exploring doubt. So in the midst of this kind of war within, right? Cause I knew uh, there was frustration, there was anger towards God and just life in general. In the midst of exploring doubt, I began to watch different videos of people that were deconstructing the people that were questioning their faith to the degree where they were taking off core fundamentals of the faith. This wasn't unusual for me. I've debunked people that were deconstructing their faith, people that have accusations against Christianity. I know all the apologetics connected with it, but it wasn't about apologetics for me. It was much more philosophical than that. It was about, well, if God is good, then why is this happening? And the common answers that I would get, and honestly that I would give, didn't feel satisfying. They didn't feel satisfying. Why? Because they didn't squelch the pain. They didn't stop the pain. They didn't stop the pain. I'm at rock bottom. I'm struggling. I haven't shot, I'm not shooting any videos right now. I'm reading a few books. I'm watching videos about people deconstructing and people just really honestly um, turning away from their faith because 
it feels good because it feels like, yeah, I relate to this. This, this makes sense to me. But at the same time, if I was honest with myself, I knew Isaac, who are you kidding? You know, God is real. You know that Christianity is true. You know that, that God's been really patient with you right now, even though you're angry at him. And you, you know that you should just start from the beginning. So that's what I did. I started with Christianity 101. Some of what turned me off in, in this stage was, was continually hearing like theological debates that really got in the weeds, that really divided Christians, that really like were like, we got to talk about every little minute theological issue and we got to make this the hugest deal ever. And at that point I was like, well, is any of this true? Like, are you guys just totally wasting your time? So I got back to Christianity 101. What is the gospel? What is What, what was I made for? What is this whole thing about? Okay. And sometimes you need to do that. Honestly, I think you do need to do that when you hit trial, when you are shaken, you go back to your foundation. What am I standing on? One important realization that I had throughout this, and this is a biblical truth, is that our suffering is not apart from God. That these trials that I'm experiencing are not apart from God, but rather are designed there to mold me, to develop me in perseverance, that I would rely more heavily on God there to mold me and to shape me. While I was in the midst of this season, I came across this video that was about earthquake testing for buildings, how they can test a building that it will withstand a, uh, a, a big earthquake. And this is really interesting engineering. I'm not super familiar with the ins and outs of this, but the video actually, God used the video to teach me something very important about my own spiritual walk. The first and most obvious thing is that it really mattered what I was building my life upon, what foundation I had. What I realized was the foundation that I was operating on, at least in part, was faulty, was faulty. And it was about the good Christian mindset, the good Christian mindset. I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to be responsible. And yes, Jesus died for my sins. Yes, I'm forgiven by him. But still, it's about me, me being a good, responsible Christian man. And God will bless me because of that, right? Isn't that the message of Proverbs? Isn't that what it's about? But what we often do is we we take Proverbs, but we don't think about Ecclesiastes, right? Those things go in pair. It's that, you know, hey, sometimes you're working and you're doing the right thing, but it still doesn't turn out for you. Why? Why is this? Well, like, are we guaranteed that we're going to have this amazing life just because we do things the right way? What happens when we experience trials? I had this mindset that as long as I was a good guy, as long as I was a Christian, as long as I was responsible, then everything would be great. What happens when it's not? You have two choices in that situation. You become bitter because your foundation isn't all that it's cracked up to be and you suppress and you suppress and you suppress and you wait until an earthquake hits that's actually going to knock your whole building down or you just pray that never happens. And sometimes that never happens for people. They never hit an earthquake that really shakes them enough to, for them to realize that their foundation is faulty. Maybe they do live that good guy Christian life, right? And everything just goes well for them and they have a nice family. And sure, there's some challenges here and there, but it never causes them to really evaluate what they're standing on. So in a lot of ways, I see this as a blessing. Here's the deal, what I found out, and this is kind of crazy. And maybe some of you guys that have developed buildings and know about foundations, this is obvious to you, but it was interesting to me. So one of the biggest things was that concrete, if you build a foundation and a building with concrete, right? Something that's really sturdy, something that's really hard, that like one of the hardest things, right? And an earthquake comes, what happens? It cracks, it crumbles. It's actually not very resilient to that kind of movement. So what happens? So what do you do? Timber, like wood, it's flexible, it's pliable, it's, it's soft in some context, right? So it's like you build that and it, it can withstand the movement when the earthquake comes. You would think, I need to build this with the hardest thing, the impermeable substance. But actually, you want something flexible. You want something malleable. You want something that can withstand the blow, right, of the earthquake. We think we can manufacture this foundation and this life that's impermeable, right? That nothing can hit it, that we're going to block out everything that's bad, you know, keep a smile on our face. No, we're doing great. No, everything is wonderful. No, I serve at church. No, I have a great family life. No, my marriage is great. Da, 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 da. We think we can, we can do that. What happens when the earthquake comes? Well, it, it crumbles down. It crumbles down. So what do we need? We need a soft and humble heart. 
a soft and humble heart. I, I look at the scriptures and I was looking at the scriptures. I was thinking about this. Um, just think about how Jesus talks about those who will be blessed. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger. These are all people that are in need. This isn't, this isn't somebody that's totally self-sufficient. No, this isn't somebody that's rock solid. This is somebody that needs. This is somebody that is soft. This is somebody that requires something from somebody else right? In order for their cup to be filled, in order to be satisfied, in order for, to the, for them to be comforted. Like they need God. They recognize that. It's not about developing this perfect concrete structure that can't be defeated. It's about being soft and moldable and malleable to the movement of God in our life. God does things in our life to soften us, soften our hearts to receive his love. Have you ever come across somebody that is, has such a hard heart, you can just tell they have a hard heart and they have such a hard time receiving love. They just won't. And they won't, they won't require it. They don't need it from you. I don't need it. I don't need you to love me. I don't care. Why? Because they've hardened their heart so much. It's impermeable. They can't get to it. Love can't get in there. So what does God do? He does things in our life to soften our heart to receive his love. In this season, I was seeing God much more as a perpetrator than as my provider. I was seeing him as the enemy rather than my friend. Something clicked in my brain that realized that I kept on fighting when I was fighting with God that wasn't doing anything. I'm fighting against the only one who can really give me the comfort and compassion that my heart needs and the love that my heart longs for. These insecurities and these pains and these wounds of my heart were drawing me away from God, were causing me to be bitter at God. God, why did you let this happen? Meanwhile, what God was wanting to do within me was say, Isaac, I've opened you up. I've made you soft. I've broken down your old foundation so you can build one that's based on me, that is soft, that is malleable, that is, that is full of love and compassion and connection and security in me and not your own abilities. One of the hardest things for me was to realize that the, the anger and the pain and the, all that that I was directing toward God, towards God was actually just a mask for the lack of love that I, that I was feeling like I was receiving in my own heart. I was feeling so insecure and so scared. I funneled that into anger. Meanwhile, Jesus wanted to come alongside me and sit next to me and say, Isaac, you don't need to be angry. Let's just cry. Let's just weep. There's a time to mourn. And honestly, that's what it took. It took continually every day reminding myself of God's love for me, his compassion for me, his, his deep care for me, that even in the pain that I experience, that God is with me and he loves me. And that might sound simplistic to you guys, but honestly, that is the difference. It wasn't about some apologetic argument that got me to be like, oh yeah, actually Jesus did rise from the dead, or actually no, God is real. No, it was about letting go of the anger that I had towards God and receiving his love and God softening me up to receive his love. I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope you were encouraged by it. If you were, I'd encourage you to give this video a like and subscribe. If you want to support what we do on this channel, uh, equipping people to follow Jesus daily, I'd encourage you to sign up on Patreon today. It would be a huge blessing. And until next time, God bless.